strong Catholic thought and culture engage the academy, professions, and the arts. In addition to our lectures, we offer an increasing array of non-credit courses, and in July we will host our first week-long summer seminar. Check out our website at uh, harvardcatholicforum.org, where you can sign up for our newsletters and register for future events. And please, consider supporting our important mission by making a financial contribution there. Tonight we extend a warm welcome to the Harvard Glee Club, who will sing Euroclay's inspiring Mess on Nouveau, a fitting celebration of this Easter season. The music will be preceded by a talk about the historical and liturgical context of the piece and its interpretation in performance. And as part of that, there'll be an opportunity to demonstrate uh, and uh, become part of some of the chants that are um, in this piece. The program will finish around six o'clock, at which point we invite all of you uh, who are here to join us for a light dinner, which will be uh, not as advertised in the courtyard because it's rather cold, but we will be having it in Di Giovanni Hall. So you exit out this way and cross over, uh, and the hall is there. Please note, this event will be archived on the Harvard Catholic Forum YouTube channel. If you like what you see and hear, please share the link to that channel with others who may be interested. All of our past events, including the earlier talks in the Sacred Music series, can be accessed in our archive at, the, at harvardcatholicforum.org. Before I introduce the speakers, let me give you a roadmap of tonight's event. Uh, the initial presentations are scheduled to last about 25 minutes. Um, and then at around 5.30, the Glee Club will decamp to the choir loft at the rear of the church and once they are assembled, the music will begin. Uh, we decided that there would not be a Q&A as part of this program uh, in order to make room for uh, the presentations um, of the music. Uh, but those of you who are here are welcome to nab the speakers later during dinner. Finally, uh, please take about 90 seconds to fill out our quick post-event survey. You will find a QRC code on the back of your handout um, you can uh, do this survey on your phone. Please take about a minute and a half to do it. Uh, it's very important and helpful to us um, in improving our programs going forward. This afternoon, two speakers will share the podium. Thomas Forrest Kelly is the Morton P. Knappel uh, Research Professor of Music at Harvard, where he was named a Harvard College Professor in recognition of his teaching and served as chair of the music department. He has lectured widely throughout the US and Europe. If I were to list only the most important of his publications and awards, we would have no time to hear him speak, so I stop here. Andrew Clark is the director of choral activities and senior lecturer on music at Harvard. He serves as the music director and conductor of the Harvard Glee Club, the Radcliffe Choral Society, the Harvard Radcliffe Collegium Musicum, and he teaches courses in conducting choral literature and musical theory in the Department of Music. And for the music, the Harvard Glee Club, an ensemble of approximately 60 tenor and bass voices, is among America's oldest collegiate choruses. Since its founding in 1858, the Glee Club has sought to cultivate and sustain the art of men's choral music through regular concerts in Sanders Theater here at Harvard, and as well as performances on the road at major venues throughout the US and Europe. The Glee Club will be directed by Andrew Clark and accompanied on the organ by David von Baron, assistant university organist at Harvard's Memorial Church. We are honored to have as co-sponsors this evening, in addition to the Glee Club, the Harvard Catholic Center, St. Paul's Parish, the Lumen Christi Institute at the University of Chicago, and the St. Benedict Institute at Hope College. Our indispensable partner in the Sacred Music Series is the St. Paul's Choir School, the only Catholic boys' choir school in the United States, resident 
since its founding in 1963 here at St. Paul's Church. The choir fills the church with inspiring music at daily and Sunday masses and weekly choral vespers. So we are especially delighted to bring the Glee Club to this magnificent barrel vaulted space which has resounded with inspiring choral music for decades. I've asked James Kennelly, the music director of the choir school and the parish, and an internationally recognized organist, conductor, vocalist, and composer to say a few words of welcome to our musicians and speakers. Thank you, Deacon Tim, and welcome to our audience, uh, and especially welcome to the members of the Harvard Glee Club. I feel as if I should be doing some special genuflection with all of this Harvard presence, even though we're kind of right in the middle of the Harvard campus. Um, we're not actually Harvard. I went to the original Cambridge um, and not the new Cambridge, so I also feel a little bit out of place. But I know that musically, we're in for an extraordinary treat. Um, personally, I feel a little self-indulgent because normally I would be conducting the choir um, and worrying about how the performance would go. Today I get to sit back and enjoy this. It's a little bit like driving a Rolls Royce with a chauffeur um, at the wheel. So I'm really looking forward to it. But I thought it would be nice to talk a little bit about the choir school, which is in the building directly to your left. Um, and in that building, it's really a hotbed of plain chant, of plain song. That is the basis of the music that we teach the choristers. These are much younger than these boys. They're grades three through eight, so most of their voices are unbroken. They're singing in the high treble range. But the plain chant that you're going to hear today forms the central part of that repertoire and indeed the repertoire of the church going back centuries, indeed millennia. Um, as you will hear later, the melody is, is almost a, a modern or a postmodern sense of what medieval should sound like. It's incredibly moving and spiritual, and it forms the basis of our repertoire. The boys sing here daily, of course, not on Mondays, but they sing here daily, and you will hear at the beginning and in the middle and at the end of the service this same plain chant, the same plain song melodies that you will hear from the Glee Club today. I thought it would also be fun to show, do a little show and tell, um, easier for those of you, of you joining us online because you'll be able to see zoomed in. But here is a, a version, a, a piece of the music of the Durufle, the Mescum Jubilo. Um, I think this is from the original printing from the 1960s, right as this piece was printed. And it brings to mind the notion that the long-term music director here, Theodore Marier, was uh, a, a great implementer of the notion of teaching plain song and performing plain song. In the early 2000s, there was a manual, a primer of teaching plain song that was written with words that he left in audio form um, by some of his pupils that we use to this day, and many people use to this day, to teach the plain song that you're about to hear. And so those are two very lovely connections, intersections, as it were, with the idea of plain song and of Harvard, of teaching, of Theodore Marier, of Maurice de Rufle, and of course, St. Paul's. So with that, I pass the podium over to my good friend and colleague, Tom Kelly, and of course, Andrew Clark. And I wish them all the best in this wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Hi, guys. I would, I would like to say here in public that you have not experienced anything in your life if you have not had happy birthday sung to you by the Harvard Glee Club. I've had that experience, and it's, everything is different now. Um, but it's a, it's a great privilege to be here to hear a piece that I'm very much looking forward to, and I'm sorry to be the thing that stands in the way of uh, now and the music. But I've been asked to say a word about this remarkable piece, Maurice Durouflé, and that's the last time I'm going to try to say it in actual French, is one of those grand um, organist, composer, improvisers who were the great musicians of 20th century France along with um, um, uh, uh, Marcel Dupre, Jean Langlais, many, many others. 
the people who presided over the great organs of the great churches of Paris, Notre Dame, Saint Sulpice, and the church of Saint Etienne du Mont, where Durufle and his wife Marie Madeleine Durufle presided. Those musicians were considered to be among the most important musicians in the country. I wish that were true in all countries about organists. Durufle wrote a lot of beautiful music. He has a requiem that many people know. Choruses know his Latin motets. There's also some orchestral music. Almost all of his vocal music is related somehow to Gregorian chant. But this mass that we're going to hear this afternoon is different, unique, special, and bittersweet in a number of ways. Uh, Durufle composed it in, I think, 1968. This was just after the closing of the Second Vatican Council. And although Durufle never said so, many people have imagined that this is Durufle's kind of song of longing um, for uh, regretting the impending disappearance, as he thought, of Gregorian chant as the traditional song of the church from the beginning of time until the adoption of, of the vernacular for the liturgy. That's just maybe he never said that, but many people think it. The remarkable thing about this mass is that it's for a single male choir singing one melodic line in, in unison, as all of chant is, along with the accompaniment, his original published version was for a very large orchestra, and the original performances were in concert form, not in liturgical form. But uh, the, the way it's usually performed is the way that Durufle probably conceived it, which is for organ and unison choir. It, the way it works is that the Gregorian chant of a particular mass is woven all the way through this piece. Sometimes it's sung by the voices, sometimes you hear it somewhere in the organ while the voices sing some wonderful rhapsodic counter melody. And I think the idea is that we are supposed to be so familiar with the chants that we recognize them when it appears on the left or overhead or on the right and uh, somebody is singing something else at the same time. We don't perhaps, all of us, actually have all that experience under our belt. And so I thought it would be nice for us to learn some of the music that we are supposed to know in order to fully experience this mass. Now, everybody here, I expect, knows that the idea of the liturgy is that it has no observers. Everybody in the liturgy has a part to play. And this is one of the things that the Second Vatican Council was particularly anxious to emphasize. That is, in the Mass, there, uh, the celebrant has an obvious role. There are also readers. There's all, there are also the singers who sing the gradual psalm, the alleluia, connected with the gospel, and who sing songs for the entrance, for the offertory during the communion. But there is also the part for the people. That's us. And the parts that uh, are designed for us are those acclamations, those sort of shouts of joy and praise that come in every mass. Lord have mercy, glory be to God on high, holy, 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 Lamb of God. Those are always there and they are always designed for us as participants. Although there is elaborate and very beautiful Gregorian chant music for those um, in a variety of different collections, those pieces got collected together in series in the Middle Ages, and they were often labeled by the poetry that sometimes accompanied the long melismas in the Kyrie. So the mass that is always, but not, uh, is often, but not always associated with feasts of Our Lady is called the mass cum jubilo, 
that is with joy, because there was once a poem associated with Kyrie that began that way. And so this is called the Mass Cum Jubilo, but it means the Kyrie and the Gloria and the Sanctus and the Agnus Dei. And, um, and that's what Durifle is interested in commenting on and meditating on in this Mass. And those are the chants that of which you have two printed in your leaflet and which we are now going to sing. What I think would be fun would be for us to learn and sing the Kyrie and then sing a little bit of the beginning of the Sanctus. My hope is that what that means is that when those melodies come sneaking in sideways somewhere in the course of the Mass, we will say, ah, I know that. And we will, be in a, we will be in the position that Mr. Durafleya hoped we would be in when we heard his mass. Not only that, but it gives me a chance to conduct the Harvard Glee Club. What do you think of that? Um, so, gentlemen, thank you very, very much for standing there for such a long time. What we've done is uh, a, a group of volunteers have selected themselves to be the cantors, the leaders here, and what we propose to do is to sing the Kyrie. We're going to sing each section of the Kyrie. Uh, the cantors will sing each section of the Kyrie, and then we all, the Glee Club and all of us together, will sing that same section after they did it. Now. You will have no trouble reading this music. It won't bother you that this is a four-line staff instead of the five-line staff you may be used to, uh, because you see there's a C clef at the beginning of there so that you know that the first note is a D. You also probably know that although the notes have different shapes, some have tails, some are square, some are diamond-shaped and so forth, that that makes no difference at all, that every note is essentially the same length as every other note, unless it has a dot, in which case it's longer. And that essentially is everything you need to know. If there's a little vertical mark underneath a note, it means that that note is the beginning of a new rhythmic group, if that matters to you. It matters to us, as I think you'll hear. So let's have a stab at the Kyrie. The idea is we sing Kyrie eleison, you sing Kyrie eleison, and so forth through three Kyrie's, three Christes, three more Kyrie's, and then we'll uh, try just singing the front part of the Sanctus. We'll sing it through one time. You'll sing it through one time. Uh, after that, we will be such experts in the performance of Gregorian chant and the melodies of the Mass Cum Jubilo that we will eagerly look forward to hearing what Mr. Durufle does with it. But after we finish singing, um, then Mr. Andrew Clark the real director of the Harvard Glee Club, will say a word about his own and the Glee Club's experience in preparing this performance. So get your music ready, here we go.
Thank you so much, Professor Kelly. And I also want to, of course, thank the Harvard Catholic Forum uh, for, for hosting us, Deacon Tim, uh, James Kennerly and the St. Paul's Choir School and the St. Paul's Community. Thank you so much for hosting us today in this majestic space. While I say a few words, I'm going to invite our students to stealthily make their way upstairs to the choir loft uh, where uh, our performance awaits us. James mentioned that the St. Paul's Choir School was founded in 1963. Really having, a, a, really having uh, at its roots um, the study of plain chant, of Gregorian chant. Professor Kelly mentioned that this piece is composed 1968. And something must have really been in the air. It could have certainly have been a commentary on Vatican II because in 1972, uh, one of my predecessors, Dr. F. John Adams, became the conductor of the Harvard Glee Club, and for a period of eight years, this choir specialized in medieval and Renaissance music, and in fact performed a majority of its concerts in the 1970s, not in Sanders Theater, our current home, but right here in St. Paul's. Certainly, I'm sure to take advantage of the beautiful acoustics of this space but to also provide our students an experience that they're going to have this afternoon, which is to perform liturgical music in a space like this for which liturgical music is composed. Certainly the Duraflay Mass was composed for a concert hall experience, but we have sung this Mass um, in churches, in services uh, in the past. And so Duraflay, F. John Adams, the Harvard Glee Club, the St. Paul's School, all invoking a rich uh, tradition, uh, rendering it in new ways, uh, exploring it through music inspired by chant, um, learning as best we can about the performance practice of chant. Um, and today, this is something of a homecoming uh, for our group to perform this work in this space. I also want to uh, uh, offer a particular uh, note of gratitude to our organist, Mr. David von Baron. Although the Glee Club is singing in unison and rendering the chant in all sorts of fun ways, uh, this is nothing short of a virtuosic work for a concert organist. It's not for the faint of heart, for sure. And David has spent a great deal of time and, more importantly, uh, care and devotion to this piece of music. And it's terrific for us to be able to perform it on this historic instrument as well. So I'll make my way back, and without any further ado, we invite you to enjoy uh, Maurice Durafle's Mescum Jubilo, uh, performed by the Harvard Glee Club.
Well, thank you so much uh, to the Harvard Glee Club. Welcome home to this place, and we look forward to hosting you again. And to our singers, speakers, organists, and everyone here, uh, please join us for a light dinner, which I understand will be in the courtyard, after all, uh, with a choice to gather in the warmth of Di Giovanni Hall, uh, if you wish. Um, access to the courtyard is straight through that door over there. You go down the stairs and out. The food awaits you. Um, there are restrooms across the bridge if you go straight out on this floor or next to Di Giovanni Hall uh, as well. Thank you so much for joining us, and have a good evening. We look forward to hosting you all for dinner.